Hey, what's going on guys? Jeff Kobe here and I'm headed to the office right now and uh, starting my day off a little bit late, but I, want, I shared something on my page uh, about a Japanese guy uh, that's been working on a puzzle for like the last 10 years, all right? So if you wanna check it out, the video is somewhere below probably, but let me give you kind of the backstory on what it is and I'll actually explain to you on how that applies to uh, life and uh, it's pretty funny. And Japanese people have these like weird TV shows right that they do stuff and this particular TV show from like experts or all right so where people write in and they talk about challenges that they're having and these experts will help them solve the problem right so this Japanese guy writes in writes a letter in and say hey I've been going to this uh, dentist for the last 10 years and and in the actual waiting room of this actual dentist uh, there's this puzzle and this puzzle, uh, he's been working on it every single time that he's been going there for the last 10 years, uh, and he can never figure out the actual answer to this puzzle. So he writes this letter and says, please, I wanna figure this out before I die, because he's an older guy, and he says, please help me out. So the show obviously gets that and gets intrigued by that and interviews the guy, and the guy actually asks the dentist, says, hey, you know what, can I go ahead and take this puzzle and then see if someone can actually solve it so they take this puzzle and this puzzle has literally like two balls okay on a string and in the center of it there's an actual stick with a round hole okay and uh, the string goes through the hole okay and on one side there's another ring that holds it and the game is to actually take this ring that's inside the string and bring it to the other side all right the other side without obviously breaking it, right? That's kind of the game. So instead of me explaining, you should check it out. But the interesting part about it is that the once the, the guy that's there, that's kind of like the host or whatever, right? He gets this and he tries it, right? Starts working it out and he can't figure it out, okay? So, so guess what they do? They go to a expert, okay? Uh, like a kind of a, a scientist or a game and he comes out and uh, um, the guy says, hey, you know what? You can figure this out. All right, and he says, "Why is it because no one would make a game like this if the answer wasn't actually there, right?" And which is kind of like, duh, buddy. Um, and the guy tries and tries to figure it out. And a couple of uh, minutes later, might have been a couple of hours, but it was short enough for TV. Um, he says, "You know what? I can't figure it out." <laughs> okay, but the cool, funny part was he draws a picture on like a whiteboard, and he says, "Yeah, the answer is simple." And he has a picture of a ball, a string, and the ball. And he says, "The game is you have to actually take." the the ring inside the string and move it that way and that's what he says and I'm just like okay duh buddy like you know um, and then he goes to a second individual all right and the second individual says oh I know the answer to this I can figure this out instantly so so the host is there and the old guy's there that's been trying to figure out for 10 years they're sitting with this guy and this guy says here i'm gonna figure it out right now and he puts a cloth over the actual game and when he puts the cloth over it he's like tinkering it you know around under the cloth and he says hey can you take the cloth away and then right when he takes the cloth away boom the ring is on the other side and everyone's like oh like the crowd oh my gosh right and then a couple of minutes later the guy says you know something is weird because his hands are a little bit off okay and uh, um, the guy says what's in your left hand right because you're supposed to take the ring from like the left side to the ring into the right side and surprise surprise there's actually two rings okay so he was hiding the real ring in his left hand and he actually had another ring in his right hand with an actual hook that has an opening like this so he put it around and covered the whole hole holding it like this and making it seem like he actually, you know, beat the game, all right? And, and it was funny because because the, at that time, I honestly thought too, I was like, oh my God, he did actually figure it out. And uh, But no, truth behold, he didn't. And the guy actually, I believe he was like a magician or something like that, right? So he had one of those like fake half, like like fake rings that looks like it's a real ring, but there's an opening, right? So, um, and that's what he's doing. And uh, um and I was shocked and everyone was shocked too and then we'd be like, oh my God, you're trying to con us, okay? And and then now finally they go to this uh, third person, all right? And this third person is an old school game expert, right? Meaning like he's, he's like a rope game expert, all right? And this rope game expert looks at it, he looks around and he's all like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. 
and they're like, oh, oh my gosh, right? And that's it's like it's obviously it's all Japanese. They have subtitles, so you can watch the video below. But she's like, oh my gosh! So he actually like does it and you know explains the process and how to do it. Like, hey, you do it this way, you do it that way, and then he puts the ring and he does it in a way that most people won't think of think of it that way, you know. And I like these puzzle games. So I'm telling you this, but it's funny, and I'll tie it into how it relates to life, how it relates to business, and pretty much anything in life, in my opinion. Um, and then instantly, a couple a couple minutes later, boom, the ring is on the other side, and he actually finishes the puzzle or whatever, okay? And and the guy asks, well, how do you know how to do this? And then the guy explains that, hey, you know what? These types of games was very popular and what they call the Edo, Edo Jidai, which is, a, which is a certain time period in uh, Japan, like back in the heydays, okay? And he said, yeah. And there's only about a handful of patterns that you have to actually know. And most of these games is either one pattern or combination of those patterns. And once you know these patterns, these games are really easy to actually figure out. All right, and then the guy that's been trying to do this puzzle for the last 10 years actually, uh, you know, watched it once, does it, and then actually solves it. And he's uh, and then he jokes around, and I think it ends with something like, "Well, finally, I can go ahead and die in peace." And that's what he says, okay? And and for me, when I saw that first one, I love it in the fact that it's like a puzzle game. So growing up, I used to play a bunch of puzzles, okay? Um, but the other side, is I was like, man, like you know how how much this relates to life. Um, and here's what I mean, right? Where certain times in, I think, in your life, you run into challenges. Nothing is ever perfect, okay? In a sense, it's only perfect in our mind, whatever we believe, but we run into challenges, right? And obviously, challenges or surprises that is not favorable to, to you is typically considered a problem. If it's a surprise that's favorable to you, you're like, oh yeah, I'm lucky, right? So surprises that are not favorable to you are considered challenges, and when you run into that, get, what do you typically do, right? And those three characters, in my opinion, uh, falls right into uh, right into what most individuals do. Like, for example, first turning to so-called expert, right? And and the expert gives them time some type of philosophical, or hey, you can do it. And uh, but in reality, he doesn't know how to do it, and he attempts it, and he couldn't figure it out, right? Maybe is that an individuals? Maybe like your you know friends that are around your circle or family, or maybe other people, right? They can't figure out the answer, but they'll say, hey, you know, yeah, it can be done, right? But they don't really give you. The answer that's number one all right and then you feel lost if that's the only people that you can turn to and you get no answers now the second type of people like in that puzzle game was what that magician or let's just be real and call it what it is and the con artist basically used some tricks and sleight of hands to actually say hey it can be done but in reality the person is pulling something over your eye and doing a magic trick literally and and to solve a problem making it seem like oh yeah it's real and you might run into that, right? Especially if you're in the space of of even like fitness. So I'm gonna start, you know, focusing on my fitness uh, following this month and uh, following February actually. And and you might be like, oh my gosh, I can take this magical pill, and then suddenly I'm gonna have six pack abs of working out six minutes a day or something like that, right? Um, which is not true at all. And uh, uh, the sleight of hand or whatever is gonna get you in trouble if you actually legitimately believe in that, right? Okay, so that's the second type. And then the third type is someone that has specialized knowledge to solve that actual problem that you may uh, run into or that challenge that you have. Just like that guy that's trying to solve the pu uh, that, that puzzle for 10 years, the answer came from a guy that actually was a puzzle expert. Not just only any puzzle expert, but this guy was a puzzle expert for this type of string puzzle, okay? The part that he says is that, hey, you know what? There are patterns that you have to actually know. And once you know these patterns, these game, this game is really, really, easy to actually beat and he says and it's a combination of these puzzles and using these puzzles is what allows you to actually solve the problem and for me when I heard that I was just like wow it's so true you know like if you run into challenges there's certain individuals I will turn to for certain advice why is because they have much superior knowledge in that space versus something else okay for example um, if I have a problem in my relationship or life am I gonna turn to the person that um, has been divorced mo multiple times Maybe, you know, to get, maybe actually ask him and ask for his advice and maybe do the complete opposite, right? Okay. Um, or are you going to turn to someone that actually have been married for over, you know, 40, 50 plus years and been through tough times and good times and actually maybe take their advice instead. All right. 
And what are other things, okay? Um, you want to actually, you know, uh, a couple things, right? We're going into tax season. So if you have some tax issues or tax liability and stuff like that, right? Am I going to turn to someone and, and actually talk to a friend or someone that maybe not has ever had that problem and asking for advice on that and nothing wrong with it right you know you can if you want to just vent to people but are they going to give you the solution and answer that's really going to help your problem or do you need a specialist to actually help you uh, get that answer right and um, a couple other things even the space so let's talk more tangible about like business right um, obviously I'm a real estate guy but I'll tie it into a lot of the, the real estate and even common sense stuff which is right now is really really popular is selling information products right how to products Products, okay uh, and or be considered a digital marketing expert or social media marketing expert or social media manager or whatever you know there's there's tons of that why is because it's so much easier to actually do this stuff because of technology and there's so much information out there in this world currently right now right tons of tons of the content so people can actually watch that and claim to be experts but in reality they may not be experts, especially if it's in a specified industry right it's a lot different when you're actually doing marketing for one industry versus a uh, product industry right like for example I sell physical products in my different business and an e-commerce business uh, called the happy pet company where I sell like dog chapsticks and stuff right how you market there versus how you market uh, to sell physical products and or coaching and consulting is a lot different all right and going back to it is is again is that the magician that's putting the sleight of hands oh man it's like kind of hard because this background right here um versus turning an expert that says hey you know what this is the way to actually solve it so i'll give you a prime example i think i did a podcast about this is about how there's a particular agent right the new agent and i actually answered this question on one of the new agent that actually was saying hey yesterday i was on a rant on instagram and they were saying hey i'm a new agent what should i actually do okay and my answer was i was just like hey you know what depending on how long you want to be in business right um your strategy is going to do uh, your strategy is going to be different, okay? And um, and my advice was, hey, learn about online marketing and digital marketing because that's the way it's going, right? Um, and then simultaneously learn the actual sales aspect, right? Because you have marketing, you have sales, right? Those are two different things, okay? And to be great at it, and then one is obviously be a salesman, okay? Whoever it is, you got to learn how to sell. You got to learn how to close. That's the bottom line, okay? I don't care what anyone else says. You want to be a successful entrepreneur, you got to be able to talk to people, fulfill someone's need, and be able to actually sell. Now, the way to sell may be different depending on what you have been exposed to in life, in your past life, or in currently, or what you grew up with, right? Like, growing up, for me, I thought sales was like icky, bad, you know, sleazy, you know, you think about like the car salesman and stuff like that, but but what changed my my thinking was, you know, reading books and having mentors and people who taught me a lot of things about sales, right? And some of the books, the example I gave to this particular guy was, hey, pick up a book by a gentleman named Tom Hopkins, Low Profile Selling, Act Like a Lamb, Sell Like a Lion. That's one of my favorite books that I read back and forth multiple times to actually be able to ask questions to potential sellers to fulfill a need so it's a need-based selling but there's certain questions to ask you know and, and when you actually learn that kind of stuff then you get a like, clarification like for example one of the big things that that I learned that I really take away is something called a porcupine technique right a porcupine technique is when someone asks you a question you ask a question back to see if that question is a legitimate objection or and or it's a concern for that actual individual so for example, if someone says, hey, where do you think the real estate market is going? Right now, depending on where you're at in your frame of mind, right? Then either one, most individuals are going to start giving their opinion about what they think that the real estate market is doing. And depending on what the actual seller is already conditioned for, right? That can either kill a sale instantly and or uh, make a sale, right? But if you do that, that's a 50 50 chance, which I don't like the odds of 50 50, okay? So what you do is in a porcupine technique is you ask a question back and then you try to get clarification. Well, if you're asking that question what do you think the market uh, market is going to do so that way i can kind of give you my opinion on what you're thinking right and then they'll tell you well i think it's going to go up but and then if you can do that hey well, with all means give your opinion on whatever thing uh, if it is going to go up or not right but at the bottom line is using that technique to get clarification okay versus killing a sale and that's a part of sales that you got to learn and then compound that with something else that i learned from a gentleman named of michael masterson uh he has a book called trusted advisor okay highly recommend for you to uh, pick that book up and that book is based on elevating the way you actually sell from 
instead of being an order taker to becoming an actual advisor, a trusted confidant um, that has fiduciary responsibility to always do the right thing for your client. And when you do that, instantly the sales become easier, which is to tell the truth, give value, okay? And when you got to know your stuff, okay? If you don't know it, this is typically where why people can't sell. You can learn the best tie down questions. You can learn the best closing techniques. You can learn all of that stuff. But if you don't legitimately know your business, right? You run across someone that's sophisticated and or someone that's smart, right? They're going to eat you up and spit you out instantly. So you got to learn your craft, okay? I hope that's obvious. But again, having those stuff, selling becomes really easy. So then the next thing is you got to make your phones ring and or you got to have people chasing you. And really that boils down to marketing, right? So you got two components, sales and marketing. So marketing before this, right, it was really, really difficult. I'll kind of end with this is that when I started in insurance and financial service sector, right, um, uh, and so, you know, everyone else in that industry will tell me that, hey, I got a door knock. I got to actually, you know, knock on businesses and talk to them and see if they want to do a business liability or workers comp, right, and go after those big policies so your commission checks are bigger, right? And rest behold, I didn't know better, so I listened to them. Now, did I get an experience? 100%. I got so much more experience actually doing that and learning the sales side because you're talking to so many different people okay but as you start doing it did you get some business 100% I got some business all right but the needle in your business only moves so much because it's not the most efficient way at that time, right? So what I discovered was a much better way to do it, which was at that time, uh, fax was still a big thing, right? So fax was a big thing. So I discovered how to do fax blast, all right? So, um, and why is because I figured out some other agent was doing that and they didn't really want to tell me how they were doing it, but I kept on asking questions to their staff and I figured out they were doing fax marketing. So rest behold, I figured that out. I Googled some stuff and I found a software at that time to actually send thousands and thousands of faxes through the fax machine to business owners, right? And at that time, fax numbers, uh, the phone number for faxes, right, was really easy to find. What do you do? You just pick up a damn yellow pages and you'll be able to find all the businesses fax number in there, right? Okay. So I would literally sit there flipping through the phone book, right, on industries that I want to write a policy to. And I would actually manually put the actual fax number into a spreadsheet so I can take that spreadsheet, put it into the fax blaster, right? And then I can send out literally quotes, okay? like blind quotes now I thought that was a genius move okay people thought I was crazy they're just like Jeff that will never work okay so I did it all right and guess what it didn't work and if anything else I actually it cost me more money because the reason why is I, I was stupid I was naive okay which is when you send a fax okay each page costs money and at that time sending a fax was freaking expensive right so imagine you're sending out a business liability quote for a restaurant to their fax machine and it's like eight pages long and I'm sending out like hundreds of those all right. Guess what my phone bill was really expensive. OK, um, so I learned really, really quickly later on that how bad of a strategy that was. OK, but I didn't stop. And what I figured out was this is that when I was talking to that other guy, he told me about a deal that he got. And I was just like, how'd you get the deal? He's all like, well, the person faxed me back a quote. And I was just like, why did they fax, fax you back the quote? And I was just like, well, I think they thought that I was their their agent. And he was just like, yeah, you know, so I think I called him up and then, you know, we started talking and then we pivoted and basically said, hey, you know what? I'm not your agent, but hey, let me actually quote you out and get your price. Right. So so I heard that. And then this is where I talk about a lot is that the new currency is imagination and creation execution in my opinion is the bare bone and i even you know ranted about this that hustle is a bare bone minimum requirement in entrepreneurship but the new currency is the imagination and creativity okay so when i heard that instantly in my brain i said okay shit i don't need to actually send eight pages to ten pages of quote all i needed to send is a cover letter and on the cover letter, make it seem like I'm actually their agent and send the cover sheet. So um, at that time, my boss at that time, right? Okay. He was from the imp forwarding company. That was his background. So when he sent faxes, I thought it was weird, right? Because I would like to like create like fancy cover letters for faxes, right? For each one, make it really personable, right? Type it up and then even sign it, right? And then send it out. But he was, he was like really weird, which was he would take, if someone faxes him something, he would take that fax cover sheet. He wouldn't create a new one. And all he would do is like cross the name out from which 
was from was his name and then change the two and put an arrow on it right and then he would write literally on the same cover sheet and then send it back whatever he's sending so I saw that and I was just like man you know what what if I just do that instead right so I took a document and then this software allowed me to merge right merge the name in so I went back in the database that I had which was just a fax machine a uh, fax number then I updated that fax spreadsheet with the actual name of the business okay all right I updated that and then I merged it into that fax machine with the two okay and then the from was me and then purposely on that right you can overlay an actual image in there so I took a blank sheet and then I literally got a marker and then put an arrow on it like that and then crossed it out and then I put thank you with the smiley face call me back you know ASAP with my number on it okay and that's what I put okay so you imagine again cover sheet okay the two arrow and then the from arrow I have an arrow going back and forth and then from the two place okay it merges in the actual name of the business and then the from arrow was was mine and then I hand wrote thank you smiley face and my number on there says call me back ASAP all right that's what I did all right so I sent it out okay and when I sent it out all right. First, I was like, okay, no. Nah. And, and, and I sent it out at nighttime. The reason why, is, as I said earlier, is I figured out that, hey, you know what? There's peak time when you're sending faxes. So fax is a lot cheaper between 1 a.m. to like 5 a.m. All right. So I figured that out. So I set it up to actually send out at night to send out like uh, like 50 or something like that. Right. The first time. And then when I came back the next day, right in the morning, um, I was shocked. Okay. Why is because I had one back. Okay. And then the, and then the person says, hey, thanks for following up with me. I'll give you a call later on today. I was like, oh, snap. All right. And that was kind of the story that started all and actually using that. So when it comes to sales and when it comes to marketing, I'll end with this because I think the battery is going to die on this. You need about one thing that works. OK. And that one thing that works. And I talked about this blue ocean versus red ocean strategy. I think on another Facebook live it might have been an actual Instagram. that I talked about this, but you just need one strategy that actually works. And if you can, you can actually crush your competition and be able to uh, grow your business very, very fast. And that's what I did and nobody else was doing that and so again now even more so because of the fact that there is technology okay there are multiple multiple tools that you can use the only challenge right now in today's business is the ability to be able to use those hacks okay the time frame is shrinking down all right because it's becoming a lot popular all right so you have to discover those and one once you discover those use it much as you can build your business to a certain point and then build build multiple legs behind it and if you stand in the place of as i said the trusted advisor the confidant then rest assured you're your business is going to flourish and you don't have to beg you don't have to freaking do the old school way of doing business and uh and that is going to be a game changer in your life. So that's all I got for y'all. Nathan, thank you for your comment, my man. So I'll be hopping on. I got to get in the actual office here and uh, get it rocking. So take care. Love y'all. Take care and bye-bye.